with questions. I have to work on that. But anyway, uh, yeah, so if there's nothing else to discuss, then we'll go ahead and start, and I don't know of anything else to discuss. So um, we were talking about, remember, we are talking about storage devices, and we're spending a particular amount of time talking about the spinning rust buckets that we still use to store data, spinning magnetic disks. Um, because most of database implementation centers around how to use these devices in a way that's as efficient as possible. So <clears throat> we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about that. And then what we're going to do as well is talk about solid state drives. Because um, how many people have a computer with a solid state drive in it? Yeah. So when I started teaching this class, like maybe four people in the class had solid state drives in their laptops. Now most people do. And so I want to make sure you understand what those things are good at, what they're horrible at, so that you have a good sense of those things as well. So anyway, we had access time, which is just how long does it take to get data after I ask for it. Um, and because of the nature of this construct, I have to slew a disk head to the appropriate cylinder that corresponds with the data that I'm accessing. And then I have to wait for the data to pass under the head because this spindle is spinning at some fixed rate of speed. And it's not under anybody's control. I mean, its, it's speed is controlled, but that's the only thing. I don't start it and stop it to access data or not. I have to just wait until the data comes by. So, uh, yeah, so that happens. <clears throat> so just to throw some of these numbers out, we talked about average seek time, which is just sort of a measurement that, that disk vendors give of how fast their disk arm assembly is able to slew to various locations. And so on average, that'll be anywhere from 3 to 15 milliseconds for, uh, for drives that you might buy. Now, the track-to-track -track seek time is much more important for us because, remember, we want to lay things out in fi physically contiguous ways so that they're faster to read. And we'll talk about this a lot. Um, we're going to take this into account as much as we can. Try to make disk seeks as small a factor as possible. So track-to-track -track seek times tend to be anywhere from point two to point eight milliseconds. And of course, if you were to um, contrast this with solid state drives, you'd say, well, solid state drives are much, much faster. They don't really have a notion of seeking. They have a notion of addressing blocks when you read them. And so that would be on the order of, you can see tens to hundreds of microseconds, much better than hard disks. Okay. And then, of course, we have to wait for the data to pass under. These are average rotational latencies based on common disk speed. So, um, and you can see how spinning the disk faster reduces our average rotational latency. So uh, the slow end, 5400 RPM, which is what uh, you know, low end laptops typically use, 5.6 milliseconds on average, and up to 15,000 RPM drives, which is, tends to be the max of what you'll see in high performance servers, and that's uh, just two milliseconds average rotational latency. That's simple math. Anybody here could do that math and hopefully get the answers I have, because um, part of the reason I like computers is because I'm not great at math, so uh, they do it for me, but hopefully those answers are correct. Now, um, are there any questions about hard disks before we go on? All right, let's uh, go ahead and start talking about, um, there's various things that people do, because remember, uh, even if you have like a super fast hard disk and it's like two millisecond access time, the processor is going on the order of uh, nanoseconds. And so you may have 100,000 or a million operations you could perform while you're waiting for your data to show up. That would be boring to anyone. So uh, the hard disk is very slow, and so we need to find various ways of improving the performance of, of our interactions. Most obvious one is buffering. And we talk about this a lot in CS24. We talk about it a lot in the operating system class. Guess what? We're going to talk about it a lot in the database class as well. So, um, like I said here, you read data, you store it into a memory buffer, and the presumption is that we'll have some kind of uh, temporal locality, so I may access that data again, especially if I'm doing read, modify, write operations, and so I can just provide the data from the buffer. Okay, that's nice, and there turns out to be many different layers of buffering. Um, just like I say here, the, uh, these operations, these, these uh, optimizations may be provided either in a hard disk or in the operating system. So, Disks now say, I've got a 16 megabyte buffer, I've got a 64 megabyte buffer for data that's actually cached on the disk device itself, and then you have buffering provided by the operating system and main memory and so forth. You have read ahead. 
Somebody asked for sector 53. Well, the presumption is they may be scanning through a file, so why don't I go ahead and get sector 54 ready as well, because that'll be right next to it. In fact, a lot of times what will happen is the entire cylinder will be read into memory, because the presumption is the other data is going to be accessed soon, and it's really cheap to access, because it's going to be rotating under the, the disk head anyway. Okay. So that's read ahead. That's a really good optimization. That actually helps a lot. Uh, I.O. scheduling. So instead of actually performing reads and writes exactly when I request them, I'm going to batch them up. And what I mean by I is the hard disk itself batches up the, the operations and tries to schedule them in a way that minimizes disk seeks. And so you'll have these kinds of algorithms called elevator algorithms where basically you get a whole series of reads and writes and the drive will try to do them in an order where it can scan across the platter. So do, 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 do doing its thing. And then it, as, as it's doing that, other operations are coming in and it'll try to do other ones in the other order. So you're trying to satisfy them in a way that minimizes disk seats. Okay? Which is an interesting thing because it has this implication you may not realize. The reads and the writes that you request may be performed in a different order than you asked for them. So the disk device itself may say, I'm going to do them in order B, whereas you gave them in order A. And that can have some pretty significant implications. We'll talk about that more when we get to transaction processing, but that can be extremely important. Now, the other aspect of this that is important is that um, writes can also be buffered temporarily uh, so that we can schedule them in a way that's more efficient. Again, writes may not be performed in the same order. But what that also means is that if power goes out before I've actually been able to perform the write that I said I was going to do, then the write may not have been performed at all. So you no longer have a guarantee that I said I want to write this data and it actually made it onto the platter. Everybody got that? That Again, remember, we're trying to build a system where if we pull the plug after a transaction commits and then you know, plug in the, uh, sheepishly plug in the computer again, the data is actually going to be there. And uh, so clearly the way these devices behave in order to make them fast kind of conflicts with that. So we need to figure out ways of dealing with that. Now on more advanced, more sophisticated hard disks, you'll actually see non-volatile write buffers where it can actually cache this write data into a non-volatile buffer that, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a battery back memory or something like that on the drive. And then that will be used to cache disk writes so that even if a power outage occurs, the data is still there. So you can think of it as, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like a baby step toward hybrid drives where you have hybrid magnetic um, and solid state drives. Okay? But uh, this tends to be on more advanced enterprise drives. You tend not to see this on most of our consumer drives. Uh, any questions about any of these? Okay, so those are some of the basic approaches that we have to uh, optimizing disk access. Now, um, <clears throat> there's more sophisticated things we'll get into. Like I said, we'll talk about that, particularly when we get into tran transaction durability. I wanted to spend some time talking about solid state drives because most people have them now. And most people think solid state drives are faster and better and more reliable than hard disks. And I think that's mostly accurate. The thing is, is that it's not entirely the case. And so I want to make sure that we spend a little bit of time talking about it. We certainly won't be exhaustive. Uh, unfortunately, you'd have to take the OS class to get the complete picture um, but this is enough that it, it's uh, relevant for uh, database systems. So we have some kind of flash memory chips. Uh, tend to be NAND flash these days. And like I say here, you can write that memory in 512 byte up to 4 kilobyte pages, sometimes maybe 8 kilobyte pages. But anyway, there's, it, it corresponds very closely to the way that spinning magnetic disks work. Okay, same sector sizes in general because we want to use them as a block storage device. And reads are very fast, so it tends to be on the order of tens of, of microseconds. Okay? Still, maybe a thousand times slower than main memory. So we'd like to avoid touching the, the solid state drive if we can. <coughs> but it's way better than a uh, magnetic disk. I mean, it's just like, you know, two or three, four orders of magnitude faster than a spinning magnetic disk. Write performance is where it can be really different, though. 
And if you do research on various solid state drives, you'll notice that the lower end solid state drives tend to have widely varying write performance and pretty asymmetric write performance when you compare it to read performance. But if you have higher end solid state drives, the ones you're, you're more willing to spend a little bit of money for, then you'll find that read and write performance are more comparable and write performance is more uniform. And you'll understand why as we talk about all the complexities of what goes on in a solid state drive. So we have some kind of memory. So this is flash memory and each one of these little gray boxes is some cell of NAND flash memory that we can write to. And this is a block storage device, so it's just the same as a magnetic disk. So we take files and break them down into blocks. <clears throat> so here's a simple example that we're going to use. This is a very small flash drive. but uh, So we have three files. Uh, file 1 has three blocks. File 2 has two blocks. And file 3 has four blocks. Very simple. And the, the interesting thing about these flash memories is that you cannot write to them unless they're empty. So if it's already holding data, you're not allowed to write to it. So, and that obviously complicates things. Because what if I want to change one of these files? What do I have to do now since this memory behaves differently from magnetic storage where I can rewrite to the same sector in, you know, physical, on the physical platter, and that's fine. But I can't do that with solid state drives. So I want to modify, as an example, block 2 of, of file F1. So I want to change that little block that's labeled F1.2. Well, I can't do it. <clears throat> what I have to do is mark the old version somehow to say this is no longer in use, but it still has data in it, so I can't use it for subsequent writes yet. And I'm going to create a new version of F1.2 that has the new version of the data. So you can see that now it's a little bit more complicated. So this is the first issue that you have with solid state drives. You cannot really use them as easily for disk data structures that have a lot of in-place modifications. Because think about what's actually happening when you do, okay, I want to change these four bytes in this sector, and I'll just write that sector out. Well, what that does on the solid state drive is you basically create a new memory cell, or you, you occupy a new memory cell, the old one has to be marked as unused now, or not uh, unused, but it's got data, but nobody is using it right now because it's, it's something old that's discarded, and we have to create a whole new memory cell with the new contents of that thing. Because, I mean, uh, everybody who's programmed for any amount of time develops this whole thing, I want to save very frequently, and I think about this in my head. I just wrote like five lines of code, and then I saved my file. Well, this is what your solid state drive is doing. Okay, you keep creating new blocks with the new version of the file data. And of course, if you think about this from the application's perspective, or even from the operating system perspective, we don't want to have to keep track of, well, what blocks actually comprise this file? I don't want to have to know, as the application writer, that the second block of F1 is now somewhere else. And so we introduce the same thing that we do. We talk about this a lot in CS24, introducing levels of indirection so we don't have to think about this. We allow um, a greater level of abstraction by having a level of indirection. And that in solid state drives is called the flash translation layer. So the flash translation layer keeps track of logical disk blocks and what physical NAND flash memory cells they map to. So you can see there's a lot of sophistication going on here. And pretty much every time you have a write, that mapping has to be updated. If you replace an existing block, that mapping has to be updated, obviously. And when you have a write that creates a new cell, extends a file, well, you have to choose some flash memory cell, and you want to do this in some way that, that wears everything evenly. We'll talk about that momentarily. And so this flash translation layer has to update its mapping basically continuously as data is being written. Okay? So this has to go on as well. <clears throat> so now we're starting to get a bigger picture of what's actually going on. Now, over time, we end up with a, a solid state drive that's basically sad, right? Um, a lot of its cells have been written to. Some are still in use. Many are not. You can see that we have this situation here where we have no more empty cells, so we can't uh, sustain any more writes to this solid state drive. So what we need to do now is to erase some of our memory cells. Well, yet another wrinkle 
is that we can only erase these cells in larger groups. So it's not that we can actually erase an, an individual cell. We have to actually erase a whole block of cells. And you can see that the disparity is much worse than what this picture describes, where it's like, oh, I have one cell I can write to, but four I have to erase. That would actually be quite nice. Um, here you can see a read-write block might be four to eight kilobytes. And by KIB, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's kibibytes. I don't say that because it sounds silly, but it's um, you know basically power of two kilobytes, which is what everybody should use anyway. Um, commercial marketing advertising stuff that really kind of introduced the whole power of 10 thing, so that's, that's annoying. But anyway, erase blocks, uh, 128 to 256 of those blocks. So I can write to four kilobytes, and when I want to erase stuff, I can only do it in multiples of two megabytes. How annoying is that? Okay. So you can see that the solid state drive has another interesting problem to solve, which is that I need to free up space so that I can perform more write, so that I don't have to, uh, you know, so I don't have to go buy another solid state drive and plug it in until it fills up. Okay. So uh, basically, I have to periodically go through and clear one or more of these erase blocks so that I can have more space. Okay. And like I say, erasing a block takes one to two milliseconds to actually perform. So if I have a situation where, uh, you know, like I say here, I want to write to file to the, the first block in that file. It's now F2.1 prime because I already wrote to it once. Uh, well, I'm lucky in this situation because I can actually clear the entire first erase block because it only has old data. Nobody's using any of that stuff, so I can go ahead and wipe it out. So I, so the solid state drive says I want to erase this erase block. And boom, now I have a whole bunch of cells that I can then use for writes again. So it goes in and marks F2.1 prime as old. It creates F2.1 double prime. Okay? Any questions? Pretty complicated, huh? I mean, you can see that this is uh, quite a bit of um, juggling that the solid state drive has to manage. Now, let's say that we're in this situation now. <clears throat> And the solid state drive needs to be proactive. In fact, solid state drives tend to be proactive about this kind of stuff. Um, it wants to try to reclaim more erase blocks to free up more space for subsequent writes because it doesn't want to have to do this in a critical situation. It'd like to do it while nobody's accessing the drive, if it can. <coughs> and so we could go in and say, well, what is the erase block with the most old data? or the fewest things that are actually currently in use. We could do something like that. And right now, it's the third erase block, just because of the example that we've constructed here. You could imagine an erase block that had empty cells in it as well. It might make sense sometimes to do that. So what it has to do, since F3.1 prime and F3.4 prime are still in there, is it has to relocate them so that it doesn't just wipe that data out when it erases that erase block. So it goes ahead and moves those things, and then it can go ahead and erase the entire erase block. And so you can see that where we started with, we had three empty cells, and now we have five empty cells. So we did take a step forward, but in the process of doing this erasure, I had to perform a couple of writes. Does everybody see that? That's pretty important as well, because the other issue that you can run into with solid state drives is this thing called write amplification. I want to perform a write to my solid state drive, and it results in additional writes being performed within the solid state drive just to free up empty cells to perform that write. Okay? This is why people get all exercised about whether or not drives have trim. You know, I don't know if you've heard of this term trim. It's, it's not an acronym. It's just a way for the operating system to tell the drive what is no longer in use. We won't talk about why that would be useful in the database class because it's an operating system. It's a file system thing. So you can certainly look it up and, and dig into that. Um, I'm also annoyed because since I have a non-Apple sourced solid state drive in my laptop, every time I do an update to the operating system, it turns off trim on my solid state drive. And if you happen to have that similar situation, you should check and make sure that that doesn't bite you. Because what happens is over time, write amplification becomes worse and worse, and writes to your drive become slower and slower. 
And uh, the reason, I'll just give you this little hint. I remember I have to stay focused so I can get through the lecture. But uh, the, the issue is that the drive thinks that data is in use when the operating system thinks the data is actually not in use. And so that's the issue, the mismatch that, that you know, Trim uh, attempts to solve. <clears throat> and basically what you have to do to restore the drive to its original performance is just wipe the entire thing. And then you can get to the point where uh, writes are fast again. You don't have write amplification initially. Anyway, so that's an issue. Um, the other thing is that blocks can only be erased a certain number of times. I think it's like 10,000 or 100,000 times. I, can't, I, I was going to look it up, and I forgot. Um, but anyway, the solid state drive also tries to lay out data, or I should say good solid state drives will try to lay out the data so that these erase blocks were approximately evenly. And that's called wear leveling. And so what it can do is say, what data hasn't been changed a lot? If it hasn't been changed a lot, then I should put it in erase blocks that have been erased more. Because the likelihood is that it still will not be changed much, and then I don't have to erase that erase block. Okay, so that, that's helpful. And then you have data that changes often. And again, the flash translation layer records this information. Then I put that into erase blocks that have a lower erase count. And that way, everything sort of erases about the same over time. And so the result is that, in general, it would seem that solid-state drives will last longer than hard disks. And I mentioned this last time. Hard disk, well, I don't know if I actually did. Hard disk lifetimes are somewhere between five and seven years. I've been incredibly fortunate with my hard disks that um, most of them have lasted many, many years beyond that. And I probably shouldn't even say that because now they'll all crash. But uh, solid state drives supposedly have a 7 to 10 year lifetime, given average write volumes that people perform to these drives. Now that's in theory. Now what happens in practice? Has anybody had a solid state drive fail? Okay. So it was very interesting. Look at it around the classroom. Nobody's had a solid state drive fail. Has anybody had a magnetic disk fail on them? Yeah. So everybody's kind of had that kind of experience. I have, certainly. So has my mom. That was really bad. <clears throat> Here's the other issue with these, these different drives. Solid state drives will fail in different ways. And this is one of the things that can really nail you. Um, hard disks, not always, but they tend to degrade over time. You tend to know that you have a problem before you actually lose all of your data. Okay? Um, the thing that prompted me to update to a solid state drive on my laptop was a very critical sector... Um, basically ended up going bad on my magnetic disk and the way I discovered it was I tried to perform a system update immediately before a class I was teaching. And then when the computer tried to reboot, it couldn't because there was some data it couldn't read. But you know what? I took that drive out and I scanned it with a drive repair tool. That was the only sector that was bad. And I was able to recover all of the rest of my data. So, you know, sometimes... The, uh, the gun shoots you in the leg, and sometimes it shoots you in the head. Um, but you have this slow degradation over time with hard disks that tends to be very common. Solid state drives are a different beast entirely. The controller hardware tends to be what fails. Because remember, the cells are already being monitored by the solid state drive. You know, they're being tended to so that their lives can be extended as much as possible. And these controller electronics, there's been studies, you know, now that solid state drives have been in in widespread use for some time now, um, power surges and power outages tend to be really hard on solid state drives. And so you have a failure or you have multiple power outages and suddenly your solid state drive says, that's it, I've had enough. And it doesn't take one sector. It takes all of your data at once. So this is the challenge with solid state drives. They fail in different ways. And so the moral of the story, as always, is back up your freaking data. Okay. Don't think because I have a solid state drive I don't have to. Like I have a solid state drive in my laptop, um, but I also bicycle to school and I know that I could get hit by a car or something. So I back up my drive like every time I do something important. <clears throat> and uh, so just make sure you keep that kind of thing in mind just in general. Solid state drives do not obviate the need for uh, backups. Okay, any questions about any of this? Okay, so... Um, we're going to start talking about database systems and file structures and so forth. 
Uh, like it says, your databases use the file system provided by the computer's operating system. And there's certain facilities that must be provided. These are all pretty obvious. You could stare, you know, you could sit down with a piece of paper and try to figure out how to write a database from scratch, and you would come up with this stuff really quickly. Uh, you need to be able to open a file in a particular path, seek to a particular location. Remember, we want to do block access of these data files. Read or write a block of data in that file. And then there may be other facilities as well to make things fast. Uh, if you're familiar with virtual memory systems and how you can memory map files into memory and allow the virtual memory system to take care of reading and writing that data back to disk, that's what good databases do because that's faster. It actually uh, reduces the amount of disk copying you have to do. But that's a bit beyond the scope of uh, this class and certainly NanoDB. NanoDB does nothing so sophisticated. I mean, it's written in Java. Why, why do we care about memory map performance? <clears throat> now, there's one other thing we need to do as well, which is we need to be able to uh, have the operating system give us some guarantee that when I have written to a file, that all of those changes have actually made it onto the platter or onto the NAND memory chips or whatever the storage medium is. Because <coughs> remember, there's these layers of buffering in between my database application and the physical device. And the device itself may have buffering as well. So like I say here, you have an operation called a sync operation, which is short for synchronize, uh, which once the operation is completed, the OS is basically guaranteeing and the device is basically guaranteeing that data is now persistent. So I write, 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 and then I sync and now the guarantee is that once that sync comes back, I pull the plug, you know, hopefully without damaging the device, plug it back in, and the device, if you went to read it, all the writes are reflected on that device. Okay? So that's very, very important. This is one of the things that OSs must provide if we're going to have any kind of durability of our transactions. Extremely important. Durability and atomicity actually go together hand in hand, but we'll, I, I don't want to get ahead of the story. Um, but this is going to become very important. <clears throat> okay? Any questions about any of this? All right, we'll talk about how we use this in the future. Uh, it's so cool. I wish we could talk about it right away, but uh, stay on track, right? i got to focus. So um, now, typically, databases do not stick solely to the block size that the operating system might provide atomically. Um, they may not also necessarily stick to the block size of the device. That can actually, it, it tends to be a knob that you can adjust on databases. NanoDB allows you to do it on a per file basis, which is kind of fun. Um, but it tends to be a power of two, just because that's easy to work with. Uh, buffers like to be that size, caches like buffers to be that size. So anywhere from what do I have here? 512 bytes all the way up to 64 kilobytes. Tends to be the general range of page sizes that databases work with. And as usual, this is a performance related reason. It makes a lot more sense to read and write blocks of data on these slow I.O. devices uh, than it is to access an individual byte. Okay? And uh, this is why they are block storage devices. I mean, operating systems provide abstractions at that level because of the, the, the performance characteristics of these devices. The other thing is that it's really a lot easier to work with blocks of data in the buffer manager and in the, the write-ahead logging and the various other facilities that the uh, database provides. Um, it's just a very convenient unit of work. <clears throat> and it's kind of interesting because we're not talking about tuples. We don't care about how tuples are laid out. We don't care about um, well, there's a lot of different ways we could store data in these pages, as we'll, we'll talk about uh, in the next few weeks. But um, the rest of the database doesn't care. It's just like, okay, I've got a page of data. It's been written to. What's changed? These are the kinds of things you can think about because it's just working with pages of data. So it's, it's nice and convenient that way. Now, the file blocks are labeled, um, you know, just numerically, so you, you can index them very easily. So numbered starting at zero, the first page is page zero and so forth. So if we want to read a block of data out of our data file, or we want to write a block, this is where our seek operation comes into the picture. We just seek to the location, like I have your block number times the page size. Or if you want, you can say block number shifted to the left by, you know, how many ever bits the page size takes. 
Okay? Super easy way of, of addressing into the, into the file. <clears throat> and the nice thing is if you pick a power of 2, that's going to correspond nicely with the sector size. It's going to correspond nicely with the operating system, buffering, and so forth. And then we just read or write that many bytes into memory. If we want to create a new block, again, most operating systems, what they will allow you to do is seek to whatever location you want. I mean, greater than zero, of course. You know, if you want to seek, you can't really seek negative. It tends to be an unsigned value. So um, I want to seek to a particular location. The file's physical extent doesn't go that far yet. Well, the OS allows me to do it, and when I actually perform the write, it will go ahead and extend the file size to that, that size. So that's the easy way to create new blocks on a file. If I want to remove blocks on a file, well, again, all I really do to the operating system is say, uh, I want to set the file size to the new shorter size, and the OS behind the scenes goes and releases those blocks on the physical device so that they can be used by other files or maybe used by that file again in the future. Okay, any questions about this? These are all pretty low-level operations. I mean, what we're talking about is basically random, random access to file data. Um, probably most of you have worked with files quite significantly in your lives, um, but probably at a higher level, either at stream level, um, even if you've done it in C, it's probably... These buttons are in the wrong place, sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, when you interact with files, it's probably with like standard I.O. and stuff like that, where you, you still access it at a stream level, not at a block level. Maybe a few of you have done uh, like some of the lower level Unix read and write operations where you can read or write blocks of data from a file. So we're getting a little bit lower level. Um, th again, this is the challenge of databases. That they span such a wide range of abstraction levels in the system. <clears throat> okay, so we have that. We have a way of accessing files and blocks. Okay, I can read blocks, I can extend files, add blocks to files, and so forth. Um, but the query engine doesn't care. It wants to work with tuples. <clears throat> and uh, I may have predicates. I need to be able to look at attributes in these records and so forth. So how do I then take this block-based storage mechanism and span the gap to uh, doing record access, record storage? Okay? So these are the questions we need to answer. How do we organize blocks within data files? How do we organize records within blocks? And are there file level organization of records as well? Okay, and we'll try to get to the first two questions today. Um, but obviously, um, we'll have to leave the file level organization of records to next time. We'll start discussing that topic at a shallow level and then explore it more in the future. OK, so there's two things we have to uh, look at. One is that. Uh, we're going to be assuming spinning magnetic disks. If you want to think about solid state drives and how these things are relevant to solid state drives, I would encourage that. Partly because how to design databases that use solid state drives effectively is still an area that's being explored. There's plenty of research papers about this topic. Okay? Um, but since our data volumes continue to grow larger and hard disks continue to grow larger and stay cheaper than solid state drives, we will continue to need to know how to interact with spinning rust disks uh, efficiently. So this will continue to be relevant. So anyway, that's the first caveat. Just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're like, but that doesn't, that's not relevant to solid state drives. Yeah, I know. Um, you can think about that. And you can explore that maybe in 123 if you would like. The other caveat is that we're talking about implementation. So you need to understand that these are just some approaches. These are some common approaches to these problems. It doesn't mean they're the best approaches. Uh, you can obviously get a lot more nuanced, but uh, you know that's another thing that's kind of fun is that you can explore, you can experiment, you can come up with your own ideas and see if they're actually better or not. And that's one of the things, the fun things about the first assignment is that people get to explore some storage, some details of storage, and uh, they tend to have a lot of fun coming up with their own ways of doing it. <clears throat> okay, so first simplification: each table's data goes in its own file. There are databases that allow you to store multiple table data or data from multiple tables into a single file. Um, I mentioned this in 121. It's called multi-table clustering file organization. And the whole idea is that if I join, if I store the records that would join together locally, physically, then it will be faster to join those things in the uh, in the actual table. So 
Uh, some database systems do this. Basically, the large commercial database systems, I think Oracle can do it, and I'm pretty sure DB2 can do it. Um, those are the two that would be most likely to be able to support multi-table clustering files. Uh, this is a great example of something that who cares when it comes to solid-state drives? Nobody cares anymore because seeks aren't a thing anymore. Okay? But with magnetic disk, it's very important. Second simplification. We're going to require that all tuples fit inside disk blocks. What a simple, uh, you know, simple world that we live in. This is not reality. And a lot of database systems have to think about how to hold records that uh, go beyond the size of a single block. Okay, like I have here, a table with bar chart 20,000 fields, and I have a page size of 4 kilobytes, or even a page size of 8 kilobytes, like SQL Server uses. Well, I have a problem. Sometimes somebody might actually use the whole 20,000 bytes, and now I have to figure out how to have a tuple that falls outside of that block. <clears throat> and there are various solutions to this approach. Uh, Postgres has a kind of a fun one, um, mainly because of its name. It's called Toast. And uh, I can't remember what the, uh, the, the acronym stands for, but if you want to look up how um, Postgres does it anyway, you can just look up Toast. And, uh, or you should probably put Postgres Toast, or you'll probably see you know, toasters and things. But uh, anyway, uh, databases have to solve this problem. We're going to pretend the problem doesn't exist. And in fact, if we try to expand a tuple too large, we're going to fail, because we don't care. <clears throat> so uh, here are operations we need to perform. Inserting, deleting, selecting or scanning records, and uh, of course we need to understand that these operations may only request a few records, or we may need to scan the entire table. <coughs> these are the kinds of operations we might perform. And we want to handle as many of the sort of common cases or expected cases as possible. So we need to think about our storage format from all of these above perspectives. Okay, we don't want to, I mean, I could always extend the file when I add new rows. And as rows are deleted, I will waste space. But it'll be really fast. So that's one option. Do I, you know, do I want to do that or not? Um, you don't want to unnecessarily hinder the speed of operation. You could try to be so efficient that you search everywhere to find, uh, you know, where the tuple optimi uh, optimally would fit, and that would waste a lot of time. So let's say that we want to execute this SQL, so insert into users values. So Joe Bob is, uh, you know, in the 21st century, he now has a website. And uh, so the database has to find a block with enough space to hold that record, so we need to talk about how that's going to be done. Here's NanoDB's solution. We start with the first block, and we see if it has space for Joe Bob's new tuple, and it doesn't. So we go to the second block, and we go to the third block, until we find a block that actually has space. Okay. And if we search entirely through the file, then and we don't find a place, then we go ahead and extend the file's size by one block, and we add it to the new block. So the question is, what is this good at, and what is it bad at? Let's say that I want to insert n rows. What's the time complexity of this? Yeah, not good, <laughs> right? Um, the answer is n squared, because every time I want to insert that new row, I search the entire file again. So we have a uh, time complexity of n squared. Now, um, but what is it good at? It does happen to be good at something. Yeah, it's pretty efficient in managing space. It's not optimal, because we don't try to find the best place. We just find the first good place. But it's pretty good at uh, managing space. So yeah, um, so that's, that's one thing you guys will get to fix in the first assignment. Make NanoDB not suck on these large inserts. Okay? So we could do things like remembering the last block in the file with free space, add, add rows there. That certainly would be an option. We could also introduce additional complexity in the file organization. Okay? <laughs> like I have here, a linked list of blocks with space with data, or space for data. So Basically, I could use this structure within the file to hunt for blocks that actually have, you know, I should say might have space for the tuple I want to add. But this is where you get into the balancing act. And I want to be careful with you guys because most of you have solid state drives. You won't be aware if you have seek problems 
when you're solving this problem because your solid state drive doesn't have seek overhead. Okay? And so we started running into that more and more as more people had solid state drives. They would solve this problem in NanoDB and they wouldn't realize that they were actually introducing a massive number of seeks. Okay? But we want to solve this for the magnetic disk case because that's going to be the common case that database systems use. So we have to think, am I introducing a whole bunch of additional seeks that on a magnetic device would actually make things horribly slow? We have to think about that kind of thing. So we're going to have some kind of block level organization. This is just one idea. If you implement this for the first assignment, that's totally fine. It won't bother me. Um, although you can see it will have a few issues. And so what we do in our file data structure is we introduce some field in each block that says, this is part of a linked list element. And now block zero, which is special, I think I have a note about this. Yeah, block zero is special um, in NanoDB because that's where, <coughs> that's where the table schema is stored. So that says, hey, I'm a heap file, and I have nine columns, and three of them are nullable, and this one's a string, and, and so forth. So um, that all goes into block zero. But we can have a field that is the root of this list of blocks that has space that we could add a tuple to. Okay? So it says block zero says, oh, go to block two. And block two is like, well, if I don't have enough space, go to block four. And block four says, go to block three. And we could do something like zero to terminate this list since block zero is special. Okay. Now, everybody here has implemented linked lists. How many of you have implemented linked lists and data files before? This is where life really starts to suck because you don't have the benefits of even C seg faulting if you access something wrong. Okay? This is the challenge of file data structures. You access the wrong bytes, it's like, sure, here you go. And you have no idea you did. You write to it, you store the value, you have no idea you clobbered something next to it. Oh, man, the worst bugs in NanoDB are bugs that involve file data structures. So there's actually solutions to this, which I haven't gotten around to implementing, but uh, I guess we'll do it the old miserable hard way. Um, but if you're curious, you should ask me. I would love to talk about that sometime. Um, maybe a special lecture in the future. Okay, so we have a list of non-full blocks, and we have this interesting nuance that pages are almost never completely full just because tuples can vary in size. Um, so we can use the table schema to figure out, well, what would be the smallest and the largest tuple size for this table file? And then I can use that to guide when I put stuff into the non-full block list or when I leave it out of the non-full block list. So I could certainly do something like that. When I insert a row, I just follow the list. Find space, add the tuple to that thing. Now I have to think, okay, well, is this thing now too full to add more tuples? And if it is, I need to remove it from my non-full list. Update the pointers. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting thing because you can see that sometimes I may need to modify two pages because I may need to remove my page from the non-full block list. And I need to put the tuple into my block and then update the previous block to point to the next block. Okay. So I have two writes instead of just one, but hey, I mean, the presumption is I'm going to be doing less writes overall or less accesses overall, so it should still be faster than my n squared stupid Donny implementation. Okay, uh, so yeah, search. Did I just say that? New row is inserted. You know what? I may have, uh, oh yeah, other performance issues. So yeah, what's another performance issue here? Hint, spinning magnetic disks. Hit giant disc arm slewing back and forth like a giant crane over the smooth surface of the platter. Yeah, the blocks aren't, uh, well, the, the real issue, they don't appear sequentially in our list. And the reason that this could happen is we could have sequences of deletes or sequences of inserts and deletes that makes our non-full list out of order. And so we say, well, how do we mitigate that? Well, you could come up with some tuning strategy where you, like, if you see as you're going through that things are not completely in order, you could try tweaking the non-full list or something like that to ease it into the appropriate order. Now, um, in the past, I've seen students who have submitted solutions like that where they slowly migrate the non-full list into sorted order, and they were awesome. It was super fast. And I saw students who did that, and it was like the worst submission in that entire school year. 
So um, you have to be really careful how you design those kinds of systems. So it's, it's a balancing act. It's about implementation. And implementation is fun because you get, there's a spectrum of what's right. And so you have to figure out what works best for your system. So just keep that in mind. Rows deleted. So block was previously full. I need to add it to the non-full list. Let's say that block 5 had a tuple removed. And now it's just not full enough to add it to the list. So the easy thing to do would be always dump it into block 0. So now block zero's, uh 2 gets changed to a 5. And 5's question mark gets changed to a 2. So it always gets added to the front of the list. And of course, that means it will become out of order. So that's not exciting. Um, so in this situation, again, you have two blocks written. So you have to think about these kinds of things. That's kind of what makes it fun. All right, any questions about this? This is one way to solve the problem. There's many other ways. In fact, let me give you another suggestion. Um, not sure if I want to or not. Eh, why not? Um, a lot of systems use bitmaps to great effect to solve these kinds of problems. So for example, I don't know where you'd stuff it. You'd have to think about that problem if you were going to solve it that way. Um, but you could have a bitmap where each bit corresponds to a block in the data file. And the bit um, is a 1 if there's space for another tuple, and it's 0 if there's, if there's not space for another tuple. And that would actually allow you to do things in a very different way and probably more efficiently. So you could think about that. You could think about that possible approach. Um, I'm not going to talk about that anymore, though, because uh, stay focused, right? I still have eight more slides and eight more minutes. <laughs> so, okay. Um, now, tuples are ordered sets of attribute value pairs. Remember, they're named. They have types. They have domains and so forth. Uh, they can be null. The thing to keep in mind is that we have the schema of every tuple that we need to access. That becomes extremely important um, because we need to use that schema to guide how we interpret the data in the file. This is the one thing I don't think I want you guys to have to implement because it took me two or three years to get all the bugs out of it. And I do not want to take that away from you. Um, you, know, you can thank me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, like I said, you can't expect a table to have all the tuples be the same size. And you can't expect a table to have all non-null values, at least not generally. So we need a way of representing tuples that can vary in size and that can have null field values. A fixed size types, they're pretty easy. And this is what I was saying. Even if you have something like char 25, numeric 12, 2, another very common situation. In those situations, the data itself doesn't encode its length because it doesn't need to. The schema tells you what the size is of the field. <coughs> Variable size fields are a little bit different, though. Var chars, those are the ones, or numerics, that don't specify precisions. Okay? So varchar n. So basically what you can do is say, well, n is less than 256. Remember, this is an upper bound. So I can just use a byte to store the size. Or if n is less than 64k, I'll use two bytes to store the size. <coughs> now, you can also use field delimiters and so forth, but then you need to escape them, and you don't know how that's going to affect things. It gets too complicated. So generally, storing a length is the easiest approach. So that's what we'll do. Okay, now nulls. The way that we handle nulls is we'll have a special part of each tuple that says which fields in the tuple are null. Okay, and we call this a null bitmap. I know that's going to come as great shock. Um, you could ask yourself, well, can I make this more efficient by um, maybe only including nullable columns in the null bitmap? Look, you're saving a few bits. Who cares? <laughs> you know? um, so in this case, we just go ahead and, and allocate one bit per each uh, attribute in the tuple. We don't care about which ones are not nullable and so forth. So here would be an example. This is Joe. Oh, actually, this is Donnie, not Joe Bob. <laughs> so um, I'm not Joe Bob. But anyway, you can see that we have uh, no bitmap at the beginning. We have four fields. Uh, three of them are not null, but uh, field 0, 1, 2 is non-null, so bit 2, if you start with bit 0, so bit, bit 0, 1, 2 is set in the uh, null bitmap, so it's set to 4, and everything else is stored as, as you would expect, so user ID is an int, stored big endian because this is Java, uh, username, 
User name is less than 256 bytes, so we store the length, and then Donnie, and the website URL, I guess, is also less than 256 bytes, which is not a great constraint, but we go ahead and store the length of the URL, and then uh, the text itself. Questions? So that's how we could represent a tuple with nulls and variable size values in it. Now the last thing we need to do is figure out um, how to represent these tuples in a block. And there's a really clever little data structure called a slotted page um, that basically you can use to represent multiple tuples of varying sizes in a fixed size block. And this is basically how it's laid out here. You can see we have a little header, hopefully some free space, and then the tuple data itself at the end. Okay, this is called slotted page. And again, you'll see variations of this depending on is the database you know, basically append only, or do you expect to be able to modify things in place or so forth? So slotted page is very, very common. So the record data itself is stored in reverse order. Record zero is last, because it was presumably added first. So it's at the end, record one comes before that, record two comes before that. Okay. The header basically says this is where each record starts. Now, where does it end? Well, you just go and look at the next thing, right? <clears throat> I should say the previous thing. So, record one. Where does record one end? Well, it ends where record zero starts. And so you can, uh, basically, you can see how conceptually you would implement this. It's not terribly complicated, except to get correct um, in a file system or a file data structure. So, uh, you know, frequently there's bugs that you have to iron out. Any questions? Now, um, the way that this would work is, let's say that we need to delete a record. Why do we store these things all compacted toward the end? Well, um, in the situation where we need to delete a record, if it's not the last record in the header, we go ahead and have a special value that is deleted. So let's say we're going to delete record one. So what I do is I go ahead and mark it as deleted, and I also collapse down R1's data. So I just remove it and slide R2's data over. Okay, so I end up with this now in the block. And I could totally hear somebody asking, wow, that seems really inefficient. Are you sure you want to slide tuple data around like that? Especially if you're like updating fields and so forth. Well, remember that we're working in systems where the overriding factor is I.O. <laughs> and so, yes, there are probably more efficient ways of doing this, but this actually works pretty well, interestingly enough. Yes? Does it matter which direction you slide from? Uh, well, you have a fixed block size, and the whole reason why we slide stuff around, that's a good question, but the reason why we slide stuff around is that we want to avoid fragmentation issues inside the block. We have a very limited amount of space. So um, uh, we want to make sure, and we don't have any fragmentation in the header because we're always allocating you know, little chunks that are the same size. Um, but fragmentation can occur with these tuples because they're different sizes, and so we try to always maximize the space. So that's why we always slide things toward the end. Now, um, so remember that as we add, basically both things could grow toward each other. That's the other thing. We can keep adding tuples until we run out of header space, or we run out of data space, or both. Okay? That's kind of the cool thing about this, and so that's why we do it. There was a question over here, a comment. That's a very good question. We'll talk about that in a second. There's a subtlety there. There's a reason why we leave that Dell marker there. Okay, so any other questions? All right, so let's see. Because we have this problem of indexes, right? We can have tuples that reference other tuples in different files. And so how do we do that? Remember, we have this situation here. If I slide R2 left and something's referring to R2, how do I update that thing? I don't want to have to deal with that. Sorry, we'll go a little bit late. We're really close. So anyway, the index needs a way of referencing other records. And so we figure out or we define some location for every tuple or every record in a data file. And the way we do this in NanoDB is very obvious, very straightforward. Block number and offset in the block. Now you can see that the block number is, is pretty obvious because the data and the header value are both in the same block. But the question is, what should the offset refer to? <clears throat> okay, like I have here, NanoDB's record pointers are uh, both two bytes, 
Block number is two bytes, offset within the block is two bytes. So you can see that this limits things to a specific maximum size. Don't worry, we'll live. <laughs> um, you know, I'll be amazed if we get up to that limitation in this term. Uh, but the neat thing about the slotted page structure is that we can refer to the offset in the header, not the offset in the data. So as the tuples data grows or shrinks over, you know, because of updates or other tuples are removed, so forth, we can keep referring to the header entry and that'll be fine. So again, we introduce a level of uh, indirection and it allows us to provide this abstraction to index files that refer to our table file. Okay? Uh, any questions? Now obviously the last thing to mention just very briefly, and then I'll let you all go, um, is that we do want to reclaim headers, uh, header entries as we can. And the only time that we really can is if there are only delete <laughs> entries to the right. Like if there's any non-deleted entry, then we have to you know, keep all the, the, uh, the intervening deletes as well. But if we get to a point where we only have trailing deletes, then we can go ahead and start reclaiming that space and adding it back to the free space pool in that block. Okay? But that's basically the only situation. That's something else I'll probably have you implement for the first assignment. I have historically, and people don't screw it up. It's not that hard. Okay, any other questions? Any questions at all about this? Okay, so there you go. That's how we'll lay things out. We'll, we'll pick this up on Monday.